Broadcasting from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, it's time for IT Health Atlanta. Brought to you by Team Logic IT, your technology advisor. Now, here's your host, Rick Higgins. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the IT Health Atlanta radio show. The show that profiles small and medium-sized market businesses and highlights how those companies use technology to succeed. IT Help Atlanta is brought to you by Team Logic IT, your managed services technology provider. Specializing in cybersecurity, cloud, and business continuity solutions, Team Logic IT leverages cutting edge technology to solve all types of business problems. Go to ithelpatlanta.com for audio archives of this show and to learn more about our sponsor, Team Logic IT. I'm your host, Rick Higgins. And today's special guest is Mark Apple with Forward Push. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Rick. How are you today? Oh, man. Doing great. Thanks. I'm really glad to have you on the show. Um, Mark, tell us, tell us who you are and what do you do? Sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Mark Apple, and I am the founder of Forward Push. We are a marketing agency that specializes in helping small businesses and startups get back to doing what they love to do, which is typically their job, and they don't have time for marketing. That's where we fill in. We are their marketing agency. And Mark, you guys are so much more than that. Um, I know that a big part of what you do is uh, is website work. Could you uh, you drill into that or lean into that and uh, talk to us about um, what you do with website and how that works with your marketing? Sure. There's a good percentage of our clients that come to us because they have a need, just like you said, for a website. We all know nowadays that it's one of the first things that people do when they search. They need it, something. They have a problem. They go to the internet and you lead them to your website. And that's where our engagement starts with our clients. But you're right. It is so much more. After that website is built, what are you going to put on that website so it keeps engaging people? And that's really where our work comes in. So For the small business owners and the startups, we're writing their monthly blogs for them. We are doing infographics, design work. We're doing videos. We're creating their email newsletters. We're running their Google ads or Facebook campaigns. So it's a full service agency. And the idea is that the small business owner is super busy. They don't have time to do all of these things or maybe just some of these things. So they're able to work with us because we love working with them. So it's a smaller scale operation on how we work with them, but it's a long-term thinking and it gives them the ability to compete with the bigger players in the market. So that actually leads me into my next question. Um, And you say you work primarily or maybe even exclusively with small businesses, but can a small or local business compete with large competitors? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. We find that day in and day out. It's certainly a long-term strategy because if you're going up against a billion dollar company in your industry, they're spending money like water, but that doesn't mean that you have to spend money like water as a small business owner. So what we tend to do is take a really hyper local focus. Most small businesses for the, for the most part are working in, in their neighborhoods or in a metro city location. And while those bigger companies certainly are working in those metro locations, they tend to be focused on, for an example here, the whole country. And we know that people like doing business with people. So when you take that local attitude and that strategy, combining that with the no like and trust of working with someone local that you can see, that you can talk to, you can go into their store, they can come to your location it makes it almost very easy to compete because we have a, a very tight focus on where we're on where we're attracting clients to our clients. Well, you talk about um, not spending money like water, and I know for all the small business people out there, myself included, really they really appreciate that. How, as a as a small business owner, should I determine what my marketing budget should be? You know, what's is there like an ideal metric for that? There is. And typically, uh, we're looking probably in the, the 10 to 15% of annual gross as a marketing budget. 
And so that 10 to 15 percent, is it can be a, a wide range. Uh, certainly when we're working with a small business owner, I like to say that we're not looking for a big check right away. That's not even in our plan. Our idea is to start not conservative so that it's you're not doing anything, but start so that you can get some movement, start gaining traction on the low-hanging fruit, and then you can move up that scale to spend more because you're actually making more. Right. So that 10 to 15%, you're talking about um, gross of a, of a startup company, or does that carry forward into uh, a mature small business? Mature business as well. So that's the first is annual sales. Gotcha. Is a, is a good number to start at. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for diving deep on that. Hey, sure. uh, Mark, give us a success story. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything recent. I mean, something that you're really proud of. Uh, talk to us about how you helped someone or solved a particular problem with someone. Yeah. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll touch on a, on a story, something that that's happened recently since we're kind of going through this pandemic and it's, and it's sort of hoarding small business owners, you know, and businesses across the country, not only here in Atlanta, but we work with a healthcare provider that does elective surgery. And basically, as soon as the pandemic started, they had to shut down. They weren't allowed to see prospective patients or even patients or even provide the surgery at their location. So it was an almost an immediate shutdown for them, which is devastating to them. Yeah, We were able to offer telemedicine to them, but in a unique way. So if you go to their website now, one of the first things you see is that you can text message the doctor. And this actually goes through a HIPAA compliant system that we have for them. So you're not actually text messaging the doctor's actual cell phone. It's through, again, a HIPAA server. And the doctor is able to converse with the prospect or patient as if it's a text message conversation. But to even make it better and where we're seeing these success is that he can do consultations. You actually can click a button on your phone and you're able to open your camera and you can have an actual conversation with the doctor. You can show the doctor the part of your body that you're talking about. You can upload images to them. So the doctor is now able to do consultations when he actually can't be physically in front of anyone. The best part of it is that his schedule is completely booked out uh, for next month on the condition that we're going to be able to see patients next month. So it's finding those ways when there is something that's facing us that's a real stumbling block, that's a roadblock and saying, okay, well, how can we sort of maintain business as usual in these times where it's not so unusual? Um, the, the, my key takeaway on that particular answer was that you put the system on a HIPAA compliant server. Could you talk about, could you talk more about that and, um, why that's important? Sure. So it's, it's important because it has to do with the regulations of the healthcare industry. And when you start to fill out a form in this case, uh, on a website that has to do with a medical practice, your information is either secure or it's not secure. Mm-hmm. So a HIPAA compliant server where that information that the person puts into the form, uh, and that can be anything from your name to your date of birth to even saying, I have a pre-existing condition or I have this condition is sensitive information. So when you hit submit, if that's not secure, that information can be hacked. And basically can be out there for anyone to see. So a HIPAA compliance server allows the information to be secure. And when it reaches the doctor, the endpoint, they also have it secured on their side as well when they're replying. So it has to do with security. It has to do with the patients, their confidence and making sure that their information stays secure. That's great. And Mark, I appreciate that that deeper dive on that aspect, because, you know, obviously this, this, this show is about you and your company and, and, uh, but, you know, as you got from the intro is we definitely want to talk about how companies like yourselves are using technology. And in this case, it seems like special technology to, to serve its, uh, to serve your client base. So thank you for that. Um, so, uh, you know, 
as a marketing company, what I know <clears throat> that you that you talk the talk and, and but do you walk the walk with with what you do? I mean, how do you how do you find your your clients? Yeah, I certainly do walk walk the walk and, and the talk a hundred percent. One of my rules for forward push is that we won't recommend anything to a client without doing it ourselves first. So if a new technology comes along, we're the guinea pig. I'll invest the money in that platform, in that software, in that marketing tactic first yeah. to figure it out, to see how it works. What are the opportunities? So we're doing everything from blogging consistently. We have an email newsletter that goes out a couple of different times a month. Uh, I also have my own podcast that turns into a, a video podcast that we put out. We also do our own social media. So all of the things that we offer to our clients, we're doing ourselves. And when we see a change in what we're doing, or again, maybe there's a new platform coming out, we're shifting just as we would tell one of our clients to do, following best practices. Well, do you want to uh, give a plug and promote the your video podcast right here? Sure. Thank you very much. It's called Your Marketing Minute. And that can be found on YouTube. And if you listen to audio on any of the podcast channels. That's great. I'm definitely going to check that out. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question for you, Mark. Uh, it's one that I always like to ask. And what's an aspect about your business that uh, people don't generally think about, but that you wish people would ask you about? <laughs> That's good. Uh, I love that. I love that question, Rick. Thank you for asking that. I think one of the things is that we all have this perception that the internet is instant. And in some cases it is. You're going to record this podcast today. It literally can be up on your website this afternoon, right? In real time, this could be a live stream. Uh, you could write a blog post this afternoon, hit submit, and it's live on your website. So things are are instant, right? You can go right. on Amazon. You practically can have your groceries in a couple hours if you wanted to. So <laughs> it is yeah. instant. The flip side of it, when you talk about for a small business and marketing, is things aren't that instant. Certainly, you can do the same thing. Write that blog post and hit submit for that small business website. It doesn't mean that Google is going to all of a sudden start driving traffic to it. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I usually end up speaking to our clients about is that these things do just take time. So it's not only the blogging example, but you could start a pay-per-click campaign today on Google, or you could start a Facebook advertising campaign. It takes these powerful algorithms and these powerful companies to figure out how to serve your ad best. Even in Facebook, if you were to run advertising, for the first couple weeks or so, and that's sort of a general, until it's starting to get enough data, it actually says in the ad portal, portal, learning, meaning that it's still trying to figure out who best to serve your ad to. All the while, it's charging you yeah. for so this, this learning the, experience. This is the algorithm that's saying that it's learning? Is that what's going on? Yes. Yeah, so that's what's going on. And so that also happens on Google with, with pay-per-click. So it's, it's the instant of I'm running ads, but the actual conversions or starting to see sales can take some time because there's a lot of things that go into place, a lot of moving parts. And that's one of the questions that I think for me that I have to kind of make sure small business owners understand. Uh, so it's not one I get asked often, but it's one that I'm giving the answer often. Got it. I want to um, lean into that a little bit more. Um, you know, full disclosure to the audience here, Mark and I are friends. have been friends and business associates for some time now. And Mark, I've heard you talk before about how important the local aspect of uh, internet and website marketing is as compared to um, national stuff. And you mentioned, I think the statistic was that 40% of Website clicks are for localized searches. Could could you uh, uh, talk about that? Yeah, I think you're talking about a stat that you and I were, were conversing about that uh, last year of all the Google searches, so 
all the searches, uh, 48% had some local intent. There you go. So what, yeah, what that means by local intent, somebody put in the city name. So they put in Atlanta or they put in the zip code 30341 with whatever they were looking for. So it might've been a uh, Chinese restaurant, Chambly, Georgia yeah. is a local intent versus putting Chinese restaurant. Same thing looking for a managed service IT provider. If you're not putting in that city or zip, the results that you're going to see are going to be kind of scattered for the most part. There are some instances where you will sort of get the best local results. But just even think about your own habits, Rick. You probably, when you're searching whether it is that that Chinese restaurant or a new place to, to go out to or or whatever it is, you're probably including some type of localization characters to get the best results for you. You're right. Yeah, I do. I don't even think about it. I just type it in, you know, I, I might even type in just my zip code. Yeah. And we see that a lot. The other thing that people are starting to do is even take it one step further. And Google sort of has been encouraging this is that you start to type in, you know, Chinese restaurant and it starts to tell you near me, nearby, yeah. And that's because we're all searching on our phones nowadays. And w- as you know best, this phone is connected to a GPS system that knows exactly where I'm standing. So when you do that search and you do the near me, nearby, it knows exactly where you are. And it will tell you how many feet away you are from that restaurant or how many miles away, right? A little bit scary. <laughs> a, a little bit scary, but also quite useful uh, yeah. for a small business owner to realize that this is how, you know, the most powerful search engine in the world, Google, is steering how people find you. Right. And if you don't have a website that's built on local intent, you can start missing out. And that's the that's the scary thing as well. I would say that's almost scarier than, you know, a giant GPS system knowing where you're standing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mark, what what do you like best about being a small business owner? I I like the independence of it. I come from a a Fortune 500 background. I worked for some pretty big, well-known companies. And uh, the reason I left it was I kind of got set up. I saw a lot of small business owners spending money with these big companies and not having success because they were sort of just another client. And it's different with me. Uh, and how I act and how my team acts. So for us, you know, every client we have, we know who their kids are. We we know when their birthdays are, um, and we know a lot about their business. And it kind of goes back to how we started this conversation, Rick. It's like how we position for a push and the work we do is we are the marketing team for that small business. Yeah. And that means that my team has to know sort of as much about the business as the owner does. And we're working with a bunch of clients. So for me, I just love knowing and working with a bunch of different business owners that all sort of have the same mentality. They all want success. That's what every small business owner wants because they're the ones writing the checks. When you start to work with the corporate clients, it's just the person coming in there that's got to spend budget that quarter. And they're not really attached to the check. That's the difference. And that's what makes me get up in the morning. That's that's great, Mark. That's a great answer. Mark, tell the audience how to get in touch with you. Yep. The best place to find me is forwardpush.com. That's our website. And if you're on social media, all of our channels are under Forward Push. That's great. Mark, thank you so much for, for being a guest today on uh, IT Help Atlanta. We uh, We really appreciate you. And folks, go to ithelpatlanta.com for audio archives of this show and to learn more about our sponsor, TeamLogic IT. Go to forwardpush.com to learn more about Mark Apple and his uh, wonderful company, Forward Push. Welcome, everyone, to IT Help Atlanta radio show, the show that profiles small and medium mid-market businesses and highlights how those companies use technology to succeed. IT Help Atlanta is brought to you by TeamLogic IT, your managed services technology advisor, specializing in cybersecurity, cloud, and business continuity solutions. TeamLogic IT leverages cutting-edge technology to solve all types of business problems. 
Go to ithelpatlanta.com for our audio archives of this radio show and to learn more about our sponsor, Team Logic IT. I'm your host, Rick Higgins, and today's guest is Al Simon with Sandler Training. Good morning, Al. Good morning. How are you doing, Rick? Oh, man, living the dream. <laughs> We're all dreaming these days, aren't we? <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate um, you having me on. Looking really glad you're here. Uh, tell us who you are and what do you do, Al? Okay, so I, I'm a I'm an old guy and I'm an old sales guy. I'm I'm uh, a 24 y- uh, year uh, career sales uh, corporate sales guy and sales manager, and then my second career for the past uh, almost 19 years. Uh, I've owned this company, Sandler Training. We do uh, sales training and coaching for uh, businesses uh, and individuals, mostly Metro Atlanta based, privately held companies, smaller sales teams. We, uh, you know, helping them with stuff like maybe their pipeline is thin. They're worried about where the revenue is going to come from. So help them with, with the prospecting side of things or maybe they have a decent pipeline, but they're not closing enough opportunities. So we help them to run the sales cycle, teach them how to build the skill sets in their teams to do that kind of thing, close deals. Or if maybe they've got uh, really um, aggressive competitors, low price competitors, and they're find themselves having to cut prices to win. And so their, their uh, profit margins are taking a beating. We help them with uh, how to win without discounting. We help them build their sales teams. Uh, so hiring, recruiting, onboarding, we help them to coach them, all that kinds of stuff. Is it all direct sales or do you work on uh, channel selling as well? Yeah, several of our clients uh, have the channel, uh, the, you know, the indirect, what do you call it, channel, or channel selling or indirect selling. Several of our clients have that going on. It's more difficult because yeah. uh, typically they don't have control of that deal. Whoever their channel is has the individual uh, relationship with the end user probably. Uh, so there's not a lot we can do there other than in terms of structure or strategy, but we can't necessarily work as well on the straight sales skills as we do with, uh, and most of our clients have, you know, have direct or a combination of direct and indirect. So you're not only training, uh, direct or direct and indirect reps, but you're training management as well, right? You've oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. As, uh, oftentimes, Rick, that's where the problem is, that's right. <laughs> is that's with right. the uh, owner slash president. Slash You're a mind reader. Manager. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. It would help yeah, if I could. Well, you read my mind is, is what is what I'm getting at. Okay. So do you have, um, if you could profile an ideal client, what would that be in terms of size, maybe uh, vertical or something along those lines? Yeah, yeah, probably we work uh, really well in the B two B scenario. Uh, okay. You know, um, like I said, privately held Metro Atlanta based companies typically. Uh, yeah, you know, we have IT companies, we have uh, financial services companies, we have um, uh, you know, we have manufacturing, distribution, you know, industrial, all kinds of different companies like that where their uh, you know their management and their and their sales teams we work with. Uh, most of them are pretty small. I mean, you know, uh, our largest client has 20 salespeople and we have a bunch of clients that are under five or even, you know, several where the owner slash president is also the sales team. Yeah. You've got the solopreneurs, I guess I call them coming in, right? Yes, yes we do. Yeah. So yeah. Um, what makes uh, Sandler training unique? How do you work with them? That's different than traditional sales training. Well, most, um, you know, most sales training and, and what I had in my you know 24 year corporate career, most of my sales training during that time was uh, seminar based. You know, you go to a one, two, three day seminar, uh, you know, you sleep through half of on, it. pardon me, you sleep through half of it. Well, you know, not me, maybe you did, <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know, actually, most of the time I sat in the back with my arms crossed, like looking at my watch, like, oh, how long is this guy going to yeah. be? Does he know when I see, see my numbers? I should be teaching this. You know, that was my yeah. attitude. But, you know, you go for one or two, three days, whatever, whatever it was. You know, we used to call it the sales training flavor of the year. And then, you know, you get a three ring binder. And then, and then you know, two, three, you know, four months later, nothing's changed. You're still winging it. You're not really using that selling system. The, Three binders, collecting dust on your on your uh, 
you know, bookshelf. And, it, and it's just, it's just a wrong way to do it. Psychologists tell us that adults learn differently. Adults learn by experiencing you know, small bits of, small bits of learning uh, or knowledge really is a better way to put it. Small bits of knowledge uh, done uh, uh, in, in iterations over long periods of time. And so what we do, our training is uh, typically 90 minutes to two hour sessions max, but they're, uh, but they're like once a week or once every two weeks or once a month, uh, over longer periods of time. It's, it's common for us to have a client for eight, nine, 10 years, some longer even. And, um, uh, and then we do individual one-on-one coaching with everybody in between the training sessions to help them apply the concepts to themselves and their world and their market and their business model and their own personality and communication style. There's so much that has to be assimilated by each individual person and each one would do it differently than the the next person on the team. What do you think the biggest challenges are to uh, a company that sells direct? Is it, is it the people is it the culture? Is it the the process that was that was in place and doesn't you know may not be working? What do you find is is the biggest thing that you've got to um, break down and rebuild with the Sandler method? Do I do I have to choose if I'm on that list? Because it's <laughs> all the, of the above. It, yes. What's the biggest? Just what? Just say what's yeah. what's the biggest problem? Is it culture? You know what? It's interesting about culture because you can take. Um, you can take a sales professional who is thriving in one scenario and maybe a recruiter gets a hold of them and gets their attention and they switch to a competitor uh, and they bring their, you know, their, their book of business with them, or certainly their, you know, Rolodex today. It's not Rolodex today. It's their contact database. And, uh, and then the new uh, hiring manager expects great things, but maybe they don't thrive in the new environment because the culture is different. People thrive, people thrive in different cultures with, with the same skill sets. Right. And um, even though it's the same industry, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, culture is hugely important. Uh, but skill sets are too. And, and, um, and, and sales process, you mentioned sales process uh, and, and the tools. Well, you're an IT firm, right? So, you know, you know so there's, you know, different companies have different, different tools, whether they're, they're electronic technical tools or whether they're, uh, uh, just simply uh, uh, manual processes or whatever kinds of processes they have, you know, different people thrive in different environments. You, you could be, uh, uh, you know, in the home office type person and thrive and then go remotely with a different company and not thrive or even with the same company, right? And, you know, go remote and not thrive. I've seen people start in the home office of a company and do well, and then they send them out to another city to start a branch out there and they, and they fall apart and, and vice versa, by the way. So, there's all kinds of variables. I don't know if I could pick a biggest one, Rick. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, I mean, you, you leaned into the to the answer there, and that's that's what I was looking for. Um, so here we are. It's April twenty uh, second, and we're in the middle of the COVID crisis worldwide. We're all having fun. Yeah, we're all having fun, and we're hoping for uh, we're hoping to just get back. Right? We're looking yeah. we're looking for that boom, but. How has your business changed with what's going on and us having to shelter in place and, and so yeah. forth? It's been it's been a, a little bit different in some ways and a lot different in others. As far as our engagement with our clients goes, the training itself is not much different. We've always had the option of virtual training. Uh, and in fact, most of our classes, we have people in the room live uh, and then other people coming in remotely through a tool like Zoom or GoToMeeting. And, um, and so we have, it's called a blended environment. And, and so, uh, we already, we always had that. Now, of course, the, the, all of our training is virtual for the time being. So it's not much different for us. And, um, you know, we do a lot of, uh, of interactive, uh, training, you know, small group sessions, uh, you know, what we call practice or role playing. And with Zoom allows us to, to take a large group, say 35 people, like what we had yesterday morning and break them up into, uh, smaller, you know, quote, virtual table groups of three to four people each so they can do uh, small group practicing, which is very, very important in learning and, uh, and then bring them all back into the larger group afterwards and, and do a debrief uh, with the entire group. So we do a lot of that today. Uh, past six weeks or so, we've been doing everything uh, totally virtually that way. On the training side, coaching has been no different. We've always coached 
uh, mostly by phone or by video conference and um, in some face to face. So we don't coach face to face right now. We, everything's, you know, Zoom or or by phone or, you know, maybe they send me a, a, via email an, an email string they've had with a client or a prospect and they ask for, you know, for my help with it. So we, you know, we do a lot of it that way as well. Where we were, I'm spending a lot of my uh, extra focus these days is, is helping my clients thrive because some of our clients are in marketplaces that are doing really well, like food distribution. Uh, other of our clients are, are really, really struggling. Uh, there's just not anything they can hardly do to get revenue, uh, like an entertainment company. That's a client of ours. And then, um, and then everybody's somewhere in between. So we've been doing a lot of stuff and there's been two watchwords that we've been really focusing on. One is empathy. Start every conversation with empathy. Uh, the second watchword, Rick, is is generosity. Uh, you know, find ways to help your clients without charging them anything or much uh, to help them. If, if they're you know they're struggling from a cash flow standpoint, from a revenue expectation standpoint, you know, you know they're not going to want to spend more money. So, but they're going to want to stay with a partner that's helped them through a bad time. Right. And so, be generous with your clients in any way you can. So we've been doing a lot of, of webinars group sessions, one-on-one sessions for people who aren't even paying us or not paying us much. We've been doing extra stuff and, uh, and it's, it's, it's appreciated and, and we enjoy it too. And, and I'm not worried about the payback. Uh, you know, the payback will come, right. uh, uh, you know, and I'd really rather than pay it forward actually have in, and everybody, everybody start to be more generous and, uh, and, and, you know, and I think that'll just helps everybody. So you mentioned um, a training session that you had just yesterday with 35 people, and that was virtual. Have you seen a um, a drop off in uh, in I don't know if the right word is attendance, but uh, business yeah. for you? Uh, and then what does your what does your pipeline look like? How's that How's that faring up for you? Okay, so that's two very different questions right there for for us personally. Right, uh, we have actually seen an increase in participation. Oh, good for you. Uh, in the training and coaching, you know, because people have time. People, you know, they're not driving, they're not flying, right. you know. And so, uh, and, and, you know, so we've actually seen an uptick of 10 to 20 percent in participation in the classes. Good for you, Al. Yeah. Um, what was your, your second question was about what again? Pipeline, I guess. Pipeline, is, uh, yeah. What are you seeing in your, is it softening up or is it, is it, uh, you know, are you seeing the so-called boom yet? Are we, are we in the boom yet? You know, a pipeline is a huge issue because think about it. You know, if, if a company is um, you know, what we hear a lot from from our clients and from other people in the marketplace is my prospects aren't spending money right now. They've hit the pause button on extra expenditures. Well, there's a couple of things wrong with that statement. One is, you know, if your if your prospects think that working with you is an expen- expenditure and not an investment, then that is your problem. You have, you have not right. created a value in right. the minds of your prospect. And, um, and then, and then secondly, you know, hitting the pause button, if they need you right now, if the pain, which is a word we use a lot, you know, if they're, which is, which is their need plus the emotion that goes with it, we call it pain. If their pain is still there, you got to be creative and finding a way to help them. Even if it means deferring payments or, having an easier buy-in with, you know, with more uh, investment later when things get back to quote normal. Uh, but you got to find someone to help them. So you're, you, you, if your pipeline is, is uh, disintegrating before your eyes right now, that is your fault. That is not your market. That is not your prospect. That is your fault. Right. And we've got that same issue because, you know, we sell too. I, I, I sell <laughs> and uh, I'm not some kind of a professor in a laboratory who used to sell, but no, not anymore. I sell every day. Have to. And uh, yeah, have to. And so I'm very much uh, uh, aware of my pipeline strength, the quality and quantity of the names on that pipeline and making sure that coming out of this pandemic, we come out of it accelerating like a race car driver accelerating out of a curve. That's what we've all got to be there. Otherwise, the pandemic slow down, maybe let's say it lasts a quarter and then you got to, And then coming out of it, your pipeline's thin. Well, that's another quarter at least where you're not going to have good revenues. That's half a year total. Yeah. How many businesses can survive that? None. You can't. You can't do it. You, you have to be selling today. You have to be prospecting. You have to do it. And now you, you do it differently. You can't do face-to-face meetings. You can't do 
networking events in you know in public right now, but there's all kinds of virtual networking. There's all kinds of ways to digitally prospect using LinkedIn and uh, cold emails, other social media, and and, and uh, the real pros are doing that. They're 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 spending a full day uh, doing what they normally do, just doing it differently. No, Al, I, I want the audience to, uh, to hear about, um, full disclosure, again, Al and I have been friends for some time now. I've been to Al's office and seen his classroom, his facilities. Um, 10 out of 10, Al, the, your, your space is really, really nice. Thank um, you. Appreciate that. Tell the, tell the audience, um, about the different technology that you use, the low voltage systems that you've, that you've deployed to, to facilitate your on-site stuff because we are going to be coming back into the classroom. At some yes. Point. Yeah. So uh, it's all about that blended learning environment I mentioned before, where we have some people live in the room, others coming in virtually. So we invested in a, in a state of the art system. Uh, we have you know, speakers embedded in the ceiling. We have, uh, and we have a noise canceling microphone in the middle of the room. We have a, a remote control I'm sorry, remote, we have a noise canceling microphone in the middle of the room and a remote control camera in the back of the room that we can move around because we have in the room itself, we have table groups uh, and, you know, because we're really into that small group learning. So we have a combination of, of uh, small group uh, uh, type uh, mini sessions and then large group sessions uh, to facilitate learning. And, um, uh, and so we're able to uh, bring in the people that have come in remotely currently through Zoom. We used to use GoToMeeting, but, um, but Zoom has a, has a better way of handling that small group breakout, yeah. virtual breakout sessions that we're making a big use of now. And then when we're back to normal and have people in the room, we'll still have people virtual because we have folks that live in different states, different countries even, uh, that are part of the sales teams that we work with. And, um, and so they'll always be virtual. And so we can break them up. And let's say we have 10, 12 people virtual. We can break them up into, say, four groups of three. And then, and then we have, you know, four or five table groups in the room that are also working together uh, uh, in the small group sessions. And then we can bring everybody back together. And so it's all about that. It, and we have go to a meeting has, has a little bit of catching up to do with Zoom, doesn't it? You know, it's interesting because go to meeting promised they could do the breakout sessions and that was coming. But they've been promising that for a while. Yeah. Right, now go go to me. I don't want to slam go to me. And they they do they have some some real good technology for other reasons. But we just find for what we're doing, Zoom is a better option right now. Yes, sir. And so we have made the the switch over. Plus we have, you know, the big smart board in the front of the room, huge seventy inch uh, you know touch screen, uh, intelligent uh, uh, device that uh, we make great use of for the audio visual uh, learning that we're that we're doing. Thanks for that. And for you folks out there listening, if anybody gets a chance to come by and see Al's operation in person, it's a real treat. And uh, he, he you. gives you the, the nickel tour and it's really nice. Um, Al, uh, what's what's an aspect about your business that people don't generally think about that, but but that you wish people would ask you? Well, you know, um, most people, when they first start talking to me, let's say it's a you know business owner that has a sales team of, let's say, seven people and uh, and, you know, and, and four of those people are the old guard, you know, guys that have been selling for, you know, 20 years and they have all kinds of experience in their industry. It's, it's interesting that the, that that business owner will often just assume that I'm only going to work with the new people, not with the, you know, the old yeah. guard. Uh, and, and, and it's in, in that mindset that, that, that's, you know, people who are, who have been around a long time doing stuff for a long time, aren't going to be open to learning new things, don't need to learn uh, new things. Um, it's interesting, but also frustrating for me. And I really wish they'd ask me, what can you do for my, uh, my, my veterans? Gotcha. And, 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 and then if, they, if I were, if I were to get asked that question, I would say, what makes you ask that question? You know, and, and if I find out that they don't think that these people are coachable and by the mm -hmm. way, they may not be, <laughs> But some of them are, and, and, and the best professionals in sales or any, in any uh, vocation, but in sales for sure, the best professionals are those, are those that understand they're always needing to improve, always yeah. need to improve, and they're open to it. 
you know, you look at any uh, buddy at the top of their of their of their profession. Let's say, you know, Tiger Woods is an excellent example. Uh, you know, Tiger Woods has a coach. Well, Tiger Woods has won 14 majors and some 70 plus right. tournaments all around the world. He's, you know, he's probably the, if not the best of all time, and maybe, maybe you could say Jack Nicklaus is, but he's certainly one of the best of all time and certainly in the top two or three. And, and he, he still has a coach. Yeah. Well, why, why is that? Right. Yeah. And, 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 and um, so I wish people, more people would be open to the idea that everybody on my team can learn new stuff and be better and more productive and make more money if they're on variable compensation, which most of our clients are. Yeah. Well, it's the senior guys that, and gals that are, um, I guess to use a cliche, stuck in a rut and they don't even yeah. know it. Right. They got well, the, they've developed a bad habit over the years and they, yet they've succeeded despite that. And that they've left all that money on the table because of that bad habit. Well, you know, Rick, I'm exhibit A. If you looked at my bio and if people go to my website and look, they'll see my bio there. You know, as I mentioned, I was 24 years as a corporate sales guy for the first 22 of those years. uh, I was a mediocre salesperson. I was an order taker, but I had numbers because I had a great territory and the phone was ringing. Yeah. So I was under the impression that I was awesome. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't until 1999, I'm 40, what, 43 years old, 44 years old, and I finally get Sandler training, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, no. Yeah. I'm a fraud. I am not really a professional salesperson. I finally realized it. And, um, and, and so I had to decide right there, okay, am I coachable, or am I going to say, hey, look, have you seen my numbers? I should be teaching this class. And looking at my watch with my arms crossed from the back of the room, I had to make a decision right there. And most people who are in that kind of a scenario need to have make the same decision. And most most never come to that, you know, to that decision. Most just right. coast along, hoping the phone's going to continue to ring and thinking they're awesome. And so it was ninety nine that you started Sandler, or that's when you first went. That's through. when I first came across it. It was two thousand one when I bought the company. Two thousand one, two thousand one. Yeah, the day, so, the, day, the day before another crisis. The day before yeah. 9-11 is when we opened our door. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You, told, you told me that before. If only I had known. <laughs> oh, my goodness. my goodness. Well, 19 years. Congratulations. What, what do you like best about being a small business owner? Oh, wow. And, I, you know, I, in, the, in the course of my 24 years as a corporate sales guy, I never really gave much thought to being an entrepreneur. You know, I, I always had the salary plus commission. I always had the benefits package. But it wasn't until I started thinking, okay, maybe Sandler training is something I should do for a living, um, that I started thinking about it. And and um, but it was scary, right? Leaving the corporate blanket, you know, yeah. that the, the benefits and the salary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then nine eleven happens. Ah, <laughs> but uh, right. but um, but you know what? I, I was I finally had passion. I finally had um, my own thing that that meant something to me and to our clients that really was important. And so to me, it was, it was, it was just really caring the passion that came with that and, and, um, and actually uh, truly enjoying the journey again. Al, thank, thank you so much. Um, I mean, we're, we're a little short on time, but I want to make some room here for you to tell our audience how to get in touch with you. Yeah. So the easiest way is our website, simoninc.sandler.com. You know, S-I-M-O-N-I-N-C dot Sandler, S-A-N-D-L-E-R.com. Got it. Simoninc.sandler.com. Yep. Phone numbers well, there. Folks, emails there, all that stuff's there. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, folks, that's a wrap for the show today. Um, go to IT helpatlanta.com for an audio archive of this show and learn more about our sponsor, Team Logic IT. I'm your host, Rick Higgins, and my guest today was Al Simon with Sandler Training. Go to simoninc.sandler.com to learn more about Al and his wonderful company, uh, Sandler Training. Al, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Rick. I enjoyed it very much. Me too.